Good evening. My name is Joseph Berger, and I'm the Theater Operations and Events Manager at Film Forum, an independent nonprofit for screen cinema in Manhattan's West Village, now in its 51st year. I'm speaking to you all live from our offices on West Houston Street. This is yet another virtual event we are hosting until we can return to live events at the theater. So first and foremost, we wish you all health and happiness at this time. Tonight's discussion is about Bill Trailer Chasing Ghosts, directed by Jeffrey Wolf and executive produced by Sam Pollard. In his 80s, while living on the streets of Montgomery, Trailer began creating artwork, drawings, paintings, sometimes on cardboard, telling stories of life in the Deep South using a colorful and spare technique. Jeffrey's film beautifully brings Trailer's wholly original sensibility to life. Trailer's work is now a part of the permanent collections of the High Museum of Art, the Schomburg Center, and MoMA. He was the subject of a 2019 exhibition at the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, where his was the first major retrospective by an artist born into slavery. You can see Bill Trailer Chasing Ghosts on the big screen here at Film Forum. We are happy to be safely welcoming patrons again at 33% capacity on all four screens. Or you can watch the film through our virtual cinema platform at filmforum.org. I'm very excited to welcome our guest moderator tonight. So Sam, please join the, the Zoom webinar. Sam Pollard is the executive producer of Bill Ch Trailer Chasing Ghosts. Sam is an accomplished feature film and television video editor and documentary producer and director. Between 1990 and 2010, Sam edited many of Spike Lee's narrative features and the two have co-produced a number of documentaries, including Four Little Girls, which Sam also edited and which opened at Film Forum in 1997. And When the Levees Broke, a four-part series about Hurricane Katrina that won a Peabody and three Emmy Awards. In 2019, Sam co-directed the six-part series Why We Hate that premiered on the Discovery Channel. In 2020, he completed MLK FBI, which premiered at the Toronto Film Festival and was shortlisted for the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. Sam, it's a huge honor to have you tonight. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, and now I'd love to welcome our first guest, Richard J. Powell. Richard is the John Spencer Bassett Professor of Art and Art History at Duke University, where he has taught since 1989. Along with teaching courses in American art, the arts of the African diaspora, and contemporary visual studies, he is the writer of such books as Black Art, A Cultural History, and Cutting a Figure, Fashioning Black Portraiture. Richard is an authority on African-American art and culture and has organized numerous exhibitions, most notably The Blues Aesthetic, Black Culture and Modernism at the Washington Project for the Arts, Rhapsodies in Black, Art of the Harlem Renaissance at the Hayward Gallery, and Archibald Motley, Jazz Age Modernist at the Nasher Museum of Art. His current book, Going There, Black Visual Satire, examines satirical cartoons, paintings, and films by African-American artists from the Harlem Renaissance to the present. Richard is also featured in the film and speaks so beautifully beautifully and eloquently about Bill Trailer. We're really happy to have you, Richard. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Joe. Finally, I'm thrilled to welcome filmmaker Jeffrey Wolf. Bill Trailer Chasing Ghosts is Jeffrey's second feature-length documentary. Previously, Jeffrey made the award-winning James Castle Portrait of an Artist a film that delves into the life and creative process of Castle as told by family, artists, and members of the deaf community. Jeffrey has also made short films about the artists James Sunford Thomas, Martin Ramirez, and Elijah Pierce. Jeffrey's articles, art reviews, and photographs have appeared in numerous publications. As a feature film editor, Jeffrey is recognized for his work with prominent directors like Arthur Penn, Sidney Lumet, and John Waters. Jeffrey, congratulations on the film. Jeffrey is also a new grandfather, so congratulations on that. And uh, one of the things I love about the film is um, mm -hmm. legacy through descendants and, and Bill Trailer's story through his, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. It's, it's such a beautiful, moving story about family. Um, I'm going to leave now and leave it up to Sam. Uh, I can't wait to hear you guys speak about this, and I'll see you in about 45 minutes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So... 
Jeff, Richard, uh, great to see both of you guys. Um, my first question is for you, Jeffrey. Uh, how did you first connect with uh, Bill Trailer? As, and, and, and really, what did you think when you first saw his work? Well, uh, Jeannie and I met an artist named Elijah Pierce when we were in college, who is a wood carver from Baldwin, Mississippi. And he got us involved in this kind of art. You know, we sort of, I particularly had grown up with museums and, and going to MoMA and kind of being interested in all that. And um, in fact, we had lent some of Elijah Pierce's work to the Corcoran Gallery of Art. And on a trip down south on my way home, I stopped by the Corcoran for a show that they were hanging. And laying on the floor were a series of Bill Trailer's work, and they stuck in my mind. I couldn't, I couldn't get them out of my mind. I followed him um, for many years after that. Um, I even st even started the foundation with the idea of eventually making a film about him. So it, he had this, you know, this. Um, it was this simple beauty that just I couldn't I couldn't express it any other way and any other thing that I ever did. So uh, it was it was there for me, you know. What about you, Richard? I know you. You know you. I remember when we talked when I interviewed you years ago about William H. Johnson. What was it? What was it that attracted you to the trailer? When did you first When did you first see his work? Sam, the first time I uh, encountered the work of Bill Trailer, I was in the New York area. I lived in New York in the late 70s, early 80s. And I remember being um, part of a, of, an, of, a, of an article that was in Black Enterprise about upcoming art and events related to African-American art. I was an artist at that time. And one of the artworks that they featured was a Bill Trailer from the Ustrom Gallery. And I, I never forgot looking at this one artist amidst all of these contemporary artists. And it was clear that this was someone who was not a, who was no longer living and 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 was and was from another era. And yet when I saw these pieces, I was really stunned, as Jeffrey said, by a kind of a modernity that that came through, um, despite the fact that that this was historic work. So I think that was actually the first time I had seen these pieces and, and it really stuck in my head. And it wasn't until years later that I had a chance to actually um, see these drawings in person. And, and my initial um, response was actually confirmed that this was really an extraordinary uh, artist. What's, what's special, Jeff, about uh, Trailer's sort of historical his, his trajectory, I mean, here's a man who was born in the 1850s and he lived up into the late 1940s. What, what is so in, interesting about his, his lifetime of work, his life, his, his living life, and how, how do you think it informed his art? His art? Well, you know, just to piggyback on, on, on your last question too with Richard is, um, is that at the time that, that I first saw the work, I thought it was very now, very present. I didn't. I didn't know that it, it, when I look at it today, I still would feel the same way. And and I actually think that the work will be like that in the future. Mm -hmm. That there's a there's something in his visual vocabulary that just kind of gets you and connects with you. Um, so so the short biography um, is that he was born in 1853 in in Dallas County near near Benton, Alabama, and um, he, he literally lived on the farm for almost 75 years of his life, some of it um, with an enslaved family, some of it on the property that he was enslaved on, that he stayed on as a sharecropper. And then in the early teens of the 1900s as a, as a tenant farmer. And, um, but during that almost 100 years that he lived, he experienced slavery, reconstruction, Jim Crow, you know, the, the time period between World War I and World War II the, the onset of the civil rights movement. And, and he moved from an agrarian society into an urban society at a time when, like 19, you know, 1935, 1930, was this very interesting time in America where industrialization was, first of all, the, the boll weevil blight kind of destroyed a lot of the farming. And so the industrial revolution was taking over. So here was a, 
a guy who, you know, needed to find a place for himself. And uh, somehow he did. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's really made him seem very special and his work is so unique. I mean, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, cate- you know, putting trailer in the category of being an outsider, outside art. What do you think of these terms for these artists? You know, Richard, you know, he's a primitive artist. He's an outsider. What do you, I mean, you're an expert in this field. What do you think of those terms being attached to someone like Trailer? Well, I teach a course at Duke called Outsiders and Insiders. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I started teaching that course because of the phenomena of artists who are socially marginalized, many of whom are Black, many of whom are poor, many of whom do not have a conventional art education, but they create. Um, but, but, but I always juxtapose the concept of outsider with insider, because it's, it's kind of interesting in, in, in the art world that that which is at one point outside becomes inside. <laughs> and, and, and so an artist like Bill Trailer, you know, living on the streets of, of, of Montgomery, Alabama, um, basically having a very narrow world of, 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 of encounters. It, it's, it's kind of an interesting American story that, that over the course of decades, this work begins to creep into the consciousness of, of, of artists like the ones who hung out with him and saw his work on the streets of Montgomery, um, it being exposed to people at MoMA um, in years later. And then, as I said earlier, um, people in the 70s and 80s beginning to show this work and beginning to realize that, that, that it fits this outside category. But there's something about the style, there's something about the, the, the sensibilities, there's something about um, the real power that lies behind the image making that makes that work really key and important and vital to a contemporary consciousness. So, so I think it's a real term, it's a real concept. It's just that, that, that it is a fluid term and that, that, that we have many examples in American art history of outsiders becoming insiders. One could say Jean-Michel Basquiat was an outsider doing graffiti you know, on the Lower East Side and, and being, being seen and picked up and incorporated into the inside of the art world. So, so this happens from time to time. Mm-hmm. Jeff, what do you think of that term using uh, yeah, well, trailer with outside art? Outside <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna steal from you on this one, Sam, in, in that I, I spent so much time in my life trying to describe the difference between all these categories, like self-taught and outsider. Yeah, you know, I, I think that outsider has become a bit of a brand. I don't know if it's particularly um uh descriptive of the work itself, but um but I, I, I want to take off on something Richard said because the, the word the work became more popular starting in the 80s, but then this new whole new group of contemporary artists are kind of doing a, a similar thing. They're not going to art stores anymore. They're not buying supplies, you know, in the traditional way. They're using found objects there. Um, and they're kind of piggybacking on that history where where Trailer kind of lived that history. And, and, and not to say that a, an African-American artist today didn't live you know, live the history of an African American or black person, but but Trailer took he had like all these memories, all this history, all these ancestral roots that he developed, and in a three year period, he just poured them all out at one time, and that's kind of this ama- you know sort of amazing phenomena. And when you take an artist like a Radcliffe Bailey and and um, Sanford Biggers who are using, um, you know, iconography from that you know from that same past. They're building on a Bill Trailer, I believe, to, to kind of get to where they're going today. It's interesting that in the film you see Radcliffe and you see, for me, I see the connection between what he does and what Trailer does. What, what did you think, Richard, when you saw that in terms of what Radcliffe is doing as an artist and the connection I, to Trailer? I love Radcliffe. <laughs> he's one of my favorite people. And he's truly one of the stars of, uh, of, of Chasing Ghosts when he's on camera and he's describing um, the imagery of Bill Trailer, when he's describing the blue that Bill Trailer uses um, from his tempera colors or gouaches, um, 
you can really tell that there's this kind of connection. There's this rapprochement between this artist from from decades ago and this contemporary artist. And uh, and 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 it kind of underscores what I was just saying earlier, that that this is a term that doesn't have anything to do with what you're looking at. It has everything to do with class and 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 categories um, of, of an art world and of a society that, that that frame some people as marginal and some people as central. Um, and, and that's just a reality of, of, of America, despite the claims of democracy and what have you. Um, but it has nothing to do with the work, because when you look at this work, I mean, as, as we've all said, you are blown away. And um, when I saw the show that, that Leslie Umberger did at the, at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, I was taken aback because she assembled all of these pieces. And you're looking at these one drawing after another after another. I mean, these are these are really, really fine, fine, fine works of art done by somebody with an incredible eye, done with somebody with 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 an incredible economy of line and somebody who has something to say. And that's all it takes to make great art. And uh, so 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 the works are not outside, but it's this kind of world that we're in that categorizes people as in and out. You know, uh, to add to that, too, I, I would use the word outside in, in the sense of outside the canon. And, and that's one of the issues I think that we're dealing with today is that a lot of work like this was left out of the canon of, of the history of art of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. So part of this, you know, part of this is to, you know, to, to try to not so much to try, but to show, you know, where it belongs. And and the other thing that um, about Leslie's show that I think was very, very important is that it's not just individual drawings. There's a narrative going on here. These pictures relate to each other. They're not one-offs. It's a, it's a, he's chronicling a time. It's a, it's, it's a bigger, it's a bigger idea than it appears to be. And he had an, a, this knack of putting big ideas into small spaces, which I think is, um, you know, do you think? Do you think Jeffy was conscious of what he was doing, or it was just sort of just came out of memory? I'm not. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, you know, like I, I often think about David Hockney uh, drawing blindfolded, or or just putting his pen down and 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 like trying to find a, an image for himself. I, I don't know what his state of mind was, to be honest with you. But um, I mean, nobody does, but. I think um, I think there was a lot of things going on. I mean, there was there there was um, racial etiquette going on. Uh, you know, uh, how much of this could he explain in front of white people? Um, I've been told, you know, through stories that people came in, you know, uh, from the from the country and would sit with them or talk to them and and um, other farmers and stuff. You know, and that. Maybe he was a little more forthright with them. Some people talk about conjure and different sorts of, um, you know, inside of that world um, relationships. But I, I, I don't know what he was thinking. I, I feel like he was, you know, like at his age and all he'd been through, in some ways he was dreaming some of this stuff in, in real life. Mm-hmm. See, see, I want to say that good art requires intention. Uh, the best work that's out there is done by someone who has their palette in front of them, their canvas, their paper, and they put their hands on that device and they they go to work. But also along with that is the power of creativity. And the power of creativity is something that 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 intention can try to steer, but 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 sometimes it just kind of comes out in in brilliant and amazing ways. Hmm. And I would say that with Bill Trailer we're getting the desire to tell the story of this animal that had a fight with another animal or this or these two people meeting on the streets of, of Montgomery and clashing with one another that's his intention but 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 the artistic part the the, the creative part is the part that just kind of wells up and then comes out in in how he renders it in such a in such a beautiful fine way Wow, good answer, good answer. What's also interesting to me, Jeff, is that, you know, you've done the James Castle film, you've done this short film with Sun Thomas, and now you've done this 
you know, this monumental piece on Bill Trailer. What is it about these people in these areas? I mean, Son Thomas was near Leland, Mississippi. You know, Trailer's in Montgomery, Alabama. What's it, what is it about that Southern sort of cultural connection that, that grabs you? Man, I'm, I'm a descendant. <laughs> of Mississippi and Georgia folks, right. but you're not. So, what is it that that connects you to these people in this in these places? You know that that that's an excellent question, Sam. Uh, you know, someday I will figure that out. But um, uh, all I can say is, when I met Elijah Pierce for the first time, that opened up my eyes to um, that Mississippi even existed, other than you know spelling it. Um, and I went. I I literally in 1982, I took a trip. In reverse, I went to visit Elijah. He gave me the name of all these family members. And um, I took a ride down south through all the towns that he had lived in as he migrated north. And, I, you know, I had done a film down there um, and learned about Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney. There were all these elements of the south that I knew nothing about or, or, or could necessarily talk about what it was like to be there. To Kill a Mockingbird was one of my favorite books growing up. So I don't know, somehow or other, I just fell in, in love with it. And one day somebody, one of the curators said, you know, it's much more complicated than you think it is. And I learned that as well. But the only thing I can point to, Ted Rosengarten talked about this with me, is because he teaches Holocaust studies beside being, you know, um, uh, beside writing about this art a lot is both of, both Gene and my parents are Holocaust survivors. And so maybe there's some kind of connection of belonging of, of you know, um, not feeling comfortable in a place or I, I've never, I've never psychoanalyzed it, but that's the best answer I can give. And it's fascinating. I mean, it's uh, every time I come across something new uh, um, down there, it, it kind of blows my mind. It's just so different than, you know, a Northern, existence okay good <laughs> what else to say it that's a good answer good answer yeah. one of the things that, that stands out to me as i watch the film and i've seen it a few times now is you really get a sense from your archival footage and and the images that you the limited images you have a trailer of what montgomery was like in the 40s and 30s and that's really special to me describe to, to me which what, what montgomery was like jeff well, when 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 Fred Barron and I, um, who who wrote you know most of the uh, d dialogue or helped me frame the um, the film, when we went down there the first time, we went with a list of places that supposedly Trailer had lived or worked, and um, we got there and we started going to the different addresses, and there was one parking lot after the other, one parking garage after the other. Every everything had literally been torn down. I mean, literally torn down. And um, um, so we, we actually walked over to the Martin Luther King Church and these two young women came out and we said, you know, like, we're looking for the image. It was on the landmark sign. We're looking for the fountain. Where's the fountain? And they pointed us down Dexter Avenue toward the fountain. And at that moment, we realized that there were only three built-in environments that were left in Montgomery the fountain, the clock, and the state house, and we saw direct comparisons between the work and these in, these environments. And then, as I started going back and visiting um, Montgomery and and Lowndes County, we started seeing more and more things that he may have seen and what his point of views were from those places. I mean, I I wanted to actually throw. Um, uh, so, in answering to your question, it was Rudy Burkhart's. Uh, film from 1941 when he was uh, stationed in the army that he made as, as kind of an art film about basically two sides of the track. He did downtown Dex downtown Montgomery from the white person's um, life and downtown Montgomery, which by the way is only about a six block radius from a black person's life. And for the first time, I saw this bustling, beautiful, you know, active city that a lot of historians who I spoke with who lived down there had never even seen this footage. And then the combination of that and photographs by, Bear, by um, um, Mary Morgan Kep, uh, which were glass negative shot in the um, 1890s in the fields in Dallas County, those two were kind of really 
these links for me that I thought made it possible to make the film. But one of the things I wanted to throw out at Richard, if I could take over moderating for one quick second, sure, is the um, is in these in this culture, you know, these phrases like absence of ruin and the and and not having images, you know, the um, the, the lack of images that existed and were carried over. Can you talk a little bit about what that means in terms of African-American history and and how that's being worked on and thought about? Yes, um, it's, it's, it's real heavy to, to, to know that something in all likelihood happened because you've talked to people or you've heard stories that people have passed down from one generation to the next to the next but you have very little material evidence for it. And, and, and uh, it just means that, uh, that, that for so many people who are doing work in uh, African-American studies, um, we almost begin with kind of um, a, a kind of a, a technology of, or, or, te or methodologies of deficit. But um, it, what it also does is that it really ramps up one's research of uh, potential and research energy. And when you were talking about the Rudy Burkhardt film, I have to say that that was mind blowing because not only did you find like 30s, 40s footage, you found footage in color. And that just kind of blew everyone away who sees your film because we're looking at Montgomery and the world that, that Bill Trailer moved through, not just in that Farm Security Administration um, WPA style black and white, but we're looking at, at, at people wearing colors and, and the sky is blue and, and, and so, the Coca-Cola sign is red and white. And so, and so what, what, what your film tells us in terms of answering your question is one has to be inventive, but one also has to dig deep in order to kind of pull out the materials that, that, that might be there and you just have to kind of keep on pushing and prodding to kind of really make these stories, you know, kind of come alive. So it is an interesting observation from my part. Then this is, I'm directing this to you, Richard. I mean, you think of you think of Trailer living on the farm for many years, then going to Montgomery. You think of someone like Archibald Motley, Chicago. You think of Aaron Douglas. You think of how some artists like Carrie James Marshall is also connected to Chicago. How important is your environment in terms of informing what you do as an artist? Wow, Sam, I think that, that one's environment is the kind of uh, intro to, to the landscape. It's the intro to, 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 to the world that you look at and you begin to assess and take um, into your mind and ultimately becomes one of the vehicles for, for image making. Um, you mentioned um, Archibald Motley, and and um, I mean, part of the reason why we love these works is that he really gives us a slice of of, of Bronzeville, um, uh, Black Chicago in the '30s. Um, as I said earlier, we don't have we don't have film footage of that moment. But when you look at an Archibald Motley, despite the fact that it's a painting, you really get the feeling and the energy of State Street, of 35th Street, of the stroll, of of the lights at night. And, my, and 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 um, Bill Trailer is another example of that. I mean, um, yes, we have the Burkhart film, but with Bill Trailer, we really get an understanding, a real feeling for what it means to be kind of between the rural and the urban, and 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 what the importance of of, of farm animals and 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 tools and and the juke joint is, and 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 encountering somebody you know um, in town. Um, which he which he represents so beautifully, and so and so environment is 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 a real key part to to how artists um, not just um, um, identify themselves, but how they ultimately begin to express and think about things that 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 are so central to their to their understanding of the world. Exactly, exactly. One of the other things that's interesting to me about the film, Jeff, is you know. We, we, we deal with a time with what I call sort of a cultural appropriation. And one thing that stood out to me was that sequence when you see the ancestors 
the descendants of 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 trailer at that at that in that footage with the the white lady who I, I don't know who she was, and she's talking about trailer's work. Mm-hmm. I mean, what do we feel about the fact that you know these white people, white artists, come down, they see trailer's work, and they basically they see that's important, but they fig you know they figure out how economically to to make some money off of it. What, what what's your feelings about that, Jeff? <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, the white woman that you're talking about is is uh, is Leslie Umberger, who spent years researching mm-hmm. the work, and and we couldn't find anyone who could speak about the work better um, than her at the at the time. And when I say better, I mean she's you know the world's authority on that. Well, she was in that, she was the one in the archival footage too, huh? She's you remember the archival footage when the when the when the trailers. Descendants are talking, and this woman is showing them the, his work. And oh, Louise Ross! I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know the, the, those those three women who were there. It's very that's good. Um, they were in love with Bill Trailer. They they weren't actually down there trying to make money. They were trying to, you know, like tell this, get the family involved in the story. I mean, that was around the time that. The first time that the family tried to do a burial um, of Bill Trailer with a headstone, because they they discovered from that time period that he had been he had been buried in an unmarked grave. So after that family reunion was the first time that the family actually considered putting a headstone there. the The crazy story is is that they had one made, and it sat for thirty years in a um, you know, in a in a mortuary, and was never picked up and never placed. And it was only after um, that place that mortuary went out of business, and somebody bought out all the stones that were in the place. That uh, somebody down in in uh, Montgomery, uh, another white person, discovered where it was and bought it back, and that was what allowed us to place it on the grave on the uh, actual grave site. So, um, you know. Appropriation. All, all I can say is from my own point of view, and 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 my attitude is is that um, I'm not telling the story. I'm I'm telling us. I'm telling the beginning of the story. It's not the end all be all of everything um, um, there is to say about Bill Trailer. In fact, I'm trying to work with Alabama State University to, to create a Bill Trailer Study Center, and uh, Howard Robinson, who's the archivist there, has been working with me for that. And, um, you know, we can only do what we can do. Sam, my Howard University brother, um, uh, Greg Tate, says nobody loves a genius child. (laughs) And I I say that to say that that so many of our black artists are those eccentric, colorful, brilliant, strange artists. And they have a hard time convincing their families, their loved ones, the world at large that they're brilliant and that they have something to give. And and I have to say that it takes some some eccentric people out there in the world, many of whom are white, (laughs) to say, oh, wow, this is really interesting. Like like Cheryl Shannon, who who in the 40s, like is like holding on to the fact that we got to let people know about this guy. And he struggled over the years to get people to appreciate him. And, and, so, and so I would say that this is an old art story of, of brilliant people. William H. Johnson was the same way. This mm-hmm. incredible African-American artist from Florence, South Carolina, who everybody thought was crazy, except for a few people who said, you know, this is really, really interesting. And it's usually few. It's not a large number of people. So thank God for time. And thank God for serendipity that these works survive so that more and more of us can realize, well, that genius child really had something to offer. And fortunately, we can, we can enjoy these gifts that, that, that he or she has given us. What was also interesting to me was, Jeff, when you interviewed some of his, his, uh, family, his, members. Set, his family members, and they would say things like, they thought it was just some paper that they could draw on the back of. Or yeah, they didn't uh, know that this this work was important. I mean, I I, I chuckled. Yeah, it's it funny, was funny, Sam. I, in the castle film, I, I have almost the exact same speech by one of the family members that said that you know she would throw away her homework, and then a week later she'd find a drawing that it had been pulled out of the garbage, and she'd find the 
a drawing that was on the back of, of her, you know, messed up homework. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think we should move, uh, we should move on <laughs> from, uh, I mean, you know, what, what Richard says is, I, I, I'd like to actually hear what he has to say about this, is that we talk to a lot of Black curators, which, by the way, they're, there's beginning to be more and more of, but, you know, it's a slippery slope for them as well. They don't want to just be tied into this kind of work. And it's, you know, they want to be taken seriously for, uh, you know, for the entire art world. They don't just want to talk about Picasso or a trailer. They want to be art historians and, and curators. And so I think um, I think we're in a, a, a wonderful transition time. And, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, that will continue. Good, good. Richard, do you have a do you have a comment about that? I'm curious. <laughs> well, I'm thinking about Sam's film, Black Art in the Absence of Light, and how um, he carefully and meticulously goes through the story of David C. Driscoll and the struggles that he had to convince the mainstream art world to accept not the not the folk artists, but people like um, Henry Asawa Tanner or Lois yeah. Lou Jones, or, yeah. or and the list goes kind of on and on. And so, and so enlightenment and, and discovery, um, uh, in particular for black artists, whether you are um, a folk artist or whether you are, you know, an incredibly academically trained and, and, and interesting artist, it's a struggle. And, um, and again, this is an old story in the art world and black artists have a particular hard time. And, and as I said, I'm just blessed to be with you all in 2021 where one hopes that, that, that there's a real kind of openness to, to the range of what, what, what one might constitute um, um, the visual, that that would include everything from, from a cutting edge artist like um, um, Nina Chanel Abney to, to, to a Bill trailer. One of the things that's interesting that, that you guys know that's been talked about a lot is that people are saying in the last couple of years, this has been uh, another renaissance in Africa, in the African American art world, from the works of Trailer to Carol Walker to you know the Astor Gates to Julian Retu. What, what do you think? Is this is this a Renaissance or is this just another blip in what I call the American dialogue about saying, okay, we want to look at some black artists, but now we'll forget about them in a few years, Jeff? Well, um, we're certainly um, we're certainly. Oh, being open to that right now. I mean, I, I, the, certainly the newspapers and the magazines are following that. But I do think that there is this kind of thing that happens where, um, you know, understanding kind of popularity comes and goes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not an art historian or a curator, so I would really throw that one to, to Richard. But, you know, it, it, the, let's talk for a second. I don't know if Richard's seen this. Probably he can't be in, in North Carolina, but... Sam and I just recently saw a show called Grief and Grievance, Morning in America, uh, which is one of the most spectacular, powerful, gut-wrenching shows I've seen in many, many years. So, um, you know, if that's an indication of where we're going, I, I, I think it's a good place. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that exhibition um, because one could argue that, that the social events of the past few years have really caused the world in general to, to step back and to think about humanity and, and, and a sense of connectedness to people who don't look like you or don't come from the same neighborhood as you. And, and in a strange way, um, artists of color um, who have been dealing with these ideas for, for, for a long, long time are finally being understood and appreciated and exhibited and collected and, uh, and, and, and it's being reflected in, in various and sundry ways that we could have never imagined. Sam, whether it lasts or not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, somebody who can predict the future, but I no will crystal say ball, that, Richard, yeah, no I can't do that. Nostradamus, is that the guy's name? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but I want to believe, because I am an optimist, I want to believe that, that, that um, the surveys of, of American art and world art and contemporary art will not be the same because of, of this particular moment and the kind of rediscoveries and celebrations 
of, of artists that go beyond um, the old conventional uh, art canon. Good. I mean, Good. Sam, one of the things that somebody brought up when we were talking the other day is there are four or five films about the, how the FBI infiltrated uh, different African-American lives from Malcolm X to MLK to Billie Holiday. Um, and, and so and I think there was even one other, but so I think that at, at least our culture is starting to pick up on these stories and at least try to come clean in some form or other, or at least alert the public that this is, you know, these are stories that need to be told the way, you know, and, and, and with some sort of truth, you know, that, that we've been missing for many, many years, well, especially I, after the last regime of, uh, you know, a power where art was kind of took this back seat to everything. Um, marginalized. It was absolutely yeah. marginalized. And I, I think that's a great segue, Jeff, into in the importance of people to, you know, either go to the theaters or go online to see, you know, Bill Trailer Chasing Ghosts, because it's a very important film about a very important artist who lived through an extraordinary period of American history that, that makes this film so, so special. You know, I, I do want to throw in a little bit of a plug to the idea that it's not just, you know, uh, it's not just talking heads. There's a lot of uh, other kinds of elements of the movie that try to create all these different layers about what Bill Trailer did and how he did it. And uh, we've got, you know, tap dance. We have an amazing tap dancer, um, Jason Smith, and, um, and and some beautiful acting, doing some readings, and so. You know, there's a lot there to 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 unpack. So, well, I think it goes back to some of the stuff that Greg Tate speaks about in the film. The importance of understanding that the African American cultural experience is not only a visual experience, it's a musical experience, it's a dance experience. All of that it connects. It's a literary experience, with the exception used from Langston Hughes and Zoe Neale Hurston. It all connects in terms of talking about this, what you've done with the film, and and how trailer is is is. Is is looked at and you know and and, and articulated throughout, especially so that it, especially the time period. I think it really yeah. reflects the time period. Yeah, absolutely. So, so any last remarks, Richard? You want to talk about in terms of the art? What, what and what's next for you? <laughs> well, uh, I um, I'm going to drop a new book this fall. Um, it's actually a new old book. I I, I did a survey book on African American art initially in 1997 called Black Art, um, and then it came out, a second edition in 2002, and the third edition is coming out um, in the fall, 2021, and it basically covers the last 20 years. And as I've already alluded to, and as you know so well, Sam, you know, a whole lot has happened in the past 20 years um, from um, major exhibitions and curators like Okwe and Wazar to Carol Walker to Aunt Jemima being retired. <laughs> so, so, so I'm really excited about my new book, um, Black Art, A Cultural History, which would be coming out in the fall uh, with Tim's and Hudson. And Jeffrey, what's next for you? Well, um, I'm also very interested in contemporary, um, contemporary art, but contemporary African-American art. And I would like to do a, a survey film that takes us from Bill Trailer through Romare Bearden and Jacob Lawrence and, and Johnson up to up to contemporary artists of today, um, and 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 kind of show how that through line works in a little bit more detail than I did in this film. But then, um, and and that film would probably focus somewhat on Romare Bearden, which is who's an artist I'm very interested in. And then um, I still have I'm I still have two or three outsider self taught visionary subject matters that I'm hoping to continue working on. Martin Ramirez being one of them. Um, I may produce, help produce or executive produce films about um, some of the uh, African-American women artists, black, um, African-American women self-taught artists from the South, because I think they've been marginalized even more so than some of uh, the artists that we've been talking about. Um, and then I'd like to do a Anthony Bourdain style travel show going around the country and visiting uh, built-in environments that the artists have made all around the country and kind of sit down with them, talk about what they do, eat lunch in their neighborhood, um, 
you know, um, Five and Dime or wherever cafe and, um, and, you know, like have a little fun with that. So it well, seems so. like a good pro past COVID thing to, uh, to get out into the country again. Good. Sounds great. There's Joe. <laughs> oh, thank, and, and, you. thank you. And, both. and Sam, we, we have to ask what, what you're working on next and what we can expect from you. I'm finishing up a, a film about uh, the phenomenal but complicated human being, tennis player Arthur Ashe, that will probably be in festivals, hopefully in the fall. And then I am uh, developing a couple of documentaries that I may be, be attached to a, a, a series about the great Bill Russell. And, uh, you know, always, always looking to find another hustle, as Jeff knows. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's also working on a, a film about Max Roach that. Oh, that's uh, right. We, Max we, we definitely have to uh, help him get that out there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, it was oh. great to have you, um, Sam, uh, moderate this Q&A. This was fantastic. Uh, Richard and Jeffrey, thank you so very much um, for you. a wonderful film and, and speaking so eloquently about the subject. Sam, it's. Always a pleasure to hear from you, and 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 uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all in person, perhaps one day. <laughs> Come on down to Film Forum. We will. Thank yes. you both. Thank you all. Thanks. Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, John. If you've yet to see Bill Trailer Chasing Ghosts, please visit our website, filmforum.org. Our virtual cinema platform presents a dynamic selection of premieres, including documentaries, world cinema, and American independence as well as restored classics. You can also visit us on West Houston Street to see Bill Trailer, Chasing Ghosts. Tickets are now available for in-person theatrical screenings at our website. Stay connected to us through our email newsletter and our social media handle, Film Forum NYC, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We will keep you up to date with additions to our virtual cinema roster, our in-person uh, theatrical screenings, and our upcoming virtual events. Again, thank you for being with us tonight, and we wish you health and happiness. Good evening. <laughs>